Telescope bike pieces come in many different varieties, many different costs, uh, features, and so on. I have here two. One is a is a fairly simple Mead. It's it's called a Mead Acromat. Generally. Uh, an eyepiece, at least anything that's uh, worth using, will have a focal length marked on it. In this case, this is a 25 millimeter, and the MA means Mead Acromat. We'll talk a little more about that in a second. So basically, what a what an eyepiece consists of is a set of lenses. Uh, this is the end that inserts into the telescope. This is the end where you uh, that you look through, and in this case, it has a fold-down rubber uh, eye guard that you can fold out of the way if you wear glasses. Well, this one is doesn't stay down very easily, uh, but basically, this is a rather simple, relatively inexpensive eyepiece. Now you can get even cheaper than this. You can get eyepieces for as little as a few dollars and up to many hundreds of dollars. And we're just talking amateur here. You get into professional, you talk, you're talking thousands and tens of thousands of dollars for the eyepieces that they use in professional observatories. This uh, eyepiece, the one I just showed you, the MA25, is a uh, of fixed focal length lens, and most of them are. They also make what are called zoom eyepieces that you can adjust you see this dot. Uh, in this case this one will go, let me turn it so it's a little easier to see, from 8 millimeters to 24 millimeters. Once again, they are basically the same thing. You have one end that goes in the telescope and the other end that you look through. Now, if you look through this and you notice as we're turning it, a couple of things are happening. One is the focal length is changing and also the diameter of what you see through the eyepiece is changing. There are there are some advantages to zoom eyepieces, but I don't tend to use them. I, I have this one mainly for star parties where young people, frankly changing eyepieces at a star party could be a, a, a problematic issue, So you're de especially when you're dealing with younger people, uh, teenagers and below, because the uh, when you change the eyepiece then everybody wants to look through the new eyepiece and then you change it again. It's easier in those cases to just use a, a zoom like this. But I generally would not use a zoom eyepiece. They're, their quality, even though the really good ones are, are very good, they're, nowhere, they're never as good for the price as a fixed eyepiece. So what are the different kinds of eyepieces that you can get. Well, down here you see one of the simplest eyepieces. Uh, this is called a Ramsden. Notice it has two lenses and it's pretty much the simplest uh, eyepiece that you uh, can get. Earlier I talked about a telescope I got when I was nine years old. It effectively had a Ramsden eyepiece, although it didn't have a changeable eyepiece. It uh, was all part of the telescope. But it uh, had an objective lens and then two lenses at the viewing end that were effectively a Ramsden. And this is just named for the, uh, for the person that popularized this particular design. Uh, another design that you often find in cheaper telescopes is a Kellner. It's a three element. You may or may not be able to see, zoom in a little bit there, that the the top lens, instead of being a single lens like in this case, 
is actually two lenses glued together. So that is a Kellner. So let's take a look at a few more. And by the way, I'm doing these sort of in order of how good they are. Now, the Kellner eyepiece sometimes is modified, and that's what a modified Acromat, an MA uh, Mead lens is, is a Kellner modified Acromat. So basically, if you would open this up, what you would find inside is, is an arrangement like that. Three elements, and these work. They're, they're reasonably uh, useful, and for a low-priced uh, telescope are a good way to go, but eventually you're going to discover that you want either a wider field of view, a better color correction, uh, less uh, astigmatism, sharper image from side to side, lots of things. And so the one of the improvements that came about, and by the way, for those of you that are just interested in the ideas of, uh, you know, what, what eyepieces work for what, I'm going to make a part two that will be sort of a practical. So for those of you that would prefer not to have all of this detail about how the lenses are made up, uh, you can skip forward to part two of, on eyepieces. But for those of you that, are, that want to continue, uh, and I hope that isn't a threat. Uh, the, the next better eyepiece is a design called an Erfel. And Erfels come in five and six element designs. This is a five element Erfel. Generally, these are relatively low cost as well. And they have less chromatic aberration. In other words, the colors don't get as don't fringe out as much in these lenses as they do in the Kellners. But they do have a problem with the stigmatism. The uh, six element Erfel attempts to solve some of the problems with that, uh, the astigmatism that is, by adding another lens. And Notice that the lens that is added, if you compare these two, is a second lens glued to the top of this lens, the middle lens, as you see here. So these both have what's called an apparent field of view of 60 degrees. Now, apparent field of view means when you're looking through the eyepiece, how restricted do you think your vision is? Obviously, most people have about 160 to 170 degrees of vision. You don't have quite 180. If you quite 180, you can see the size of your eyes. But uh, but when you look through an eyepiece, you 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 never get the 150 or 60 degrees that you're used to. You get something smaller than that. In the case of the Erfels, you usually get between 60 and 70 degrees. They're, they're pretty good lenses, they are better than the Kellners, and properly designed and using good quality materials, they represent a, a real good value. Another lens that is relatively low price, in this case, uh, the this actually has five elements, but usually the orthoscopics only have four, in other words, usually one or both of these lenses are all are combined. And by the way, there are advantages to having two lenses glued together like this instead of just one big lens ground to this total shape. Part of it is they're easier to make, but so they're therefore cheaper. But also, you can adjust the type of material in each lens so that you get a little better quality in the image. But this is basically a four element, or depending on how you count it, five element orthoscopic. Generally, these are about as good as the Erfel lenses. The next step up is what's called a plossel. And 
These are usually the, the eyepiece that people upgrade to when they are uh, replacing the, the eyepieces that came with their telescope. Usually the cheaper eyepieces come with the telescope, like the, the MA that I showed you, the Mead. This came with one of my telescopes. And, and you can upgrade it to a Plossel. Plossel has either four or five elements. This one is shown as a four element, but you can also have a five element. They generally have a little bit narrower field of view. They're, it's 50 to 55 degrees. And the big problem with Plossels is if you don't have a really good uh, coatings on the lenses and the sides coated black, you will get internal reflections. It's not an issue generally when viewing dim objects, but when you're looking at something like the moon, it really makes a difference. So it's not that the plossels are bad, they're actually better than many of the others. It's just that they're not as good as some of these uh, slightly better lenses. Well, one of the lenses that is rather famous in astronomy is the Nagler lens. Now, Nagler is now, uh, I think it's Orion that he works for. And anyway, he started making telescope or telescope eyepieces. His son is now involved, and uh, his design was the first to offer a wide apparent field of view, in this case 82 degrees, without a lot of chromatic aberration, that is color fringing, or astigmatism. And notice that this has an extra pair of lenses down here right at the entrance to the Nagler. So the, the top is, is not much different, for example, from the orthoscopic, if you compare the top to, to this one. The top part is roughly the same amount of work as that one, but by adding this, this additional pair of lenses down here, the Nagler produces a much wider field of view. So instead of getting 50 to 60 degrees, or maybe in some cases 70, you get 80 or so degrees. Then there is a fairly premium lens that rivals the Nagler called the Panoptic. And you'll see those uh, occasionally for sale. Generally, Nagler's Panoptics, you're talking $100 up. And for the really good ones, in short focal lengths with uh, wide fields of view, you can be talking two, three hundred dollars. I think I said earlier Nagler was with Orion. I think it's Teleview. I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not an expert in these areas. These, this is just based on things I've picked up over the 25 or 35 years that I've been doing astronomy uh, as a as a hobby. So those are the basic eyepieces that you will find. You'll find variations of these in, in various ways. For example, here is a chart that I uh, got out of a magazine. I don't remember when or where, but probably 15 years ago, 10 years ago, that lists the different manufacturers and all of their the lenses. And you see it's actually in two parts, one part for short focal length and one part for long focal length lenses. So there is, as the, uh, the you might say, there are a plethora of lenses. Generally, and when I get to part two, I'll talk a little bit about this, you don't need a lot of lenses. For most things, depending on what you want to look at, you'll find that two or three lenses does most of what you need to do. And then, as we'll also talk about when we get to the uh, part two, you can add a Barlow lens. So, in part two, we will talk about some of these lenses, as well as the Barlows that you can use to double the effective uh, 
focal length. So for example, if you have a, a 25 millimeter and you put this into a Barlow lens with a 2x Barlow, it's the effective, effectively a 12 and a half millimeter. And those can have some advantages. But as we'll also talk about in part two, some disadvantages. So I hope you've enjoyed this little overview of some of the theory behind, or at least the, the mechanical construction of, these various eyepieces. Uh, in part two, we'll actually apply some of this to looking at various things in the sky. So look forward to that, and in the meantime, have a nice day.